It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Franklin uh, Chang Diaz, a friend of many, many years, uh, who is uh, not only a, uh, uh, a former NASA astronaut, but also uh, an innovator. Uh, I think uh, this morning uh, he's going to be uh, sharing with us some thoughts about uh, uh, human spaceflight. Uh, and then um, I believe it's tomorrow uh, that we'll be um, uh, getting a talk uh, on the subject of uh, a, a, a passion of Dr. Diaz's, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the opportunity of a very high efficiency um, uh, plasma rocketry, uh, in the sense, in, the, in particular, the, uh, the, the VASIMIR, uh, Variable Specific Impulse Magnetic Rocket. I, 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 and I, I, that was not being read, that was being recalled. But not this morning. <laughs> this morning okay. is, is uh, human space flight. Uh, and so with that, uh, it is my pleasure to turn the podium, at least uh, uh, electronically, uh, over right. to, uh, to Franklin. So please, welcome. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, 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 John, and uh, uh, greetings to um, all, all of you. Um, uh, from from Japan, I, I ended up in in Tokyo for, for uh, a meeting, and, and so I am so sorry I, I, I couldn't uh, be physically there with you. But um, uh, this miracle of electronic communication, I, th I think that it's not, not even a time delay. That seems pretty nice. Um, so I was asked to um, to give you a little, a few, say a few words on uh, living and uh, and working in in space, and um, I think uh, it's important to consider that uh, I'm a really old guy, and so my uh, space experience, um, uh, which began in 1986, and ended in in 2002. Um, so many years have passed, and so things have changed a little bit. But I think some of the same uh, things that we uh, we found, or I guess I found in my flights, uh, are still in in effect. So I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective on that. But so let me uh, just uh, attempt to, to share my screen here. You should uh, have a, a good view there of the Galileo uh, spacecraft. And, and, and I, I wanted to show you that uh, image uh, as the first uh, slide uh, because, you know, the, the, this, I think this was the, um, the first and perhaps the only, I think it was the only uh, uh, nuclear-powered um, uh, spacecraft that was launched from the space shuttle. So we launched, uh, launched Galileo in 19... Uh, uh, 89, so it was after the Challenger explosion, and so um, the Centaur upper stage, which was going to take it directly to Jupiter, was not available any, anymore, so they used the, the inertial upper stage, which was a, a lower capability a booster. So it had to go and do some sort of a cosmic uh, ballet, um, getting gravity assist from you know, the Earth and Venus and so on. It took about six years for Galileo to get to Jupiter. And But the, the point on, on this slide is that it was powered by two nuclear um, uh, radioisotope uh, generators, and we had to keep those things uh, cooled. Uh, and that caused a lot of problems on the launch pad, and it almost cost us to abort the mission uh, luckily, uh, we were able to solve the problems that we encountered on the way up, and we, um, in a hurry, uh, deployed Galileo on orbit number six. I, I think it was not very quickly, as soon as we got into orbit, we launched it, and it uh, went on its way to Jupiter. So it, it has a happy ending, but it was a very, a very difficult uh, few minutes to get up and get it. Uh, get it launched. Um, it could have been a pretty bad situation. Anyway, it, it ended well. So um, 
so so but, but Galileo, I work for you um, as we you, you know you, you're sitting now uh, at Y12, you know the cradle of uh, of uh, you know nuclear power uh, industry in the United States, and so I thought it was appropriate to bring this image at the very beginning. So, but living and working in space um, is is uh, involves a lot. A lot more than than um, you know, launching things from the space shuttle, and that is, um, you know, you, you, we have to keep each other um, healthy and in good shape. Uh, astronauts have to spend time uh, taking care of their bodies and their uh, their well-being, and and, and being um, uh, able to to maintain health uh, requires uh, some training. Uh, in this particular image, uh, I was uh, trying to to take it, um, video, actually video of um, Ellen Baker's uh, ret retina. You have to remember that in 1989, we didn't really have the capability for telemedicine that we have today. In a, in a, the, the, this was one experiment we did where we actually the uh, live images of uh, the retina down to mission control for um, the uh, flight uh, doctors uh, to be able to see this in real time. And so, you know, having the capability to diagnose a, 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 um, an illness uh, in space, being able to treat an illness in space, uh, it's a real challenge. It's something that we have to uh, be prepared to do, especially in long uh, journeys uh, to, you know, to Mars and, and, and beyond. So this is an important one. This one here is, um, is some of the activities that oftentimes you don't see on TV, but these are things that have to be done every day. Uh, in, this, in the case of the space shuttle, we had to maintain uh, you know, the quality of the air that we were breathing and uh, scrubbing uh, the CO2 from the atmosphere was really important, uh, had, it had to be done. And the way to do it in those days was uh, by means of um, uh, lithium hydroxide uh, canisters. And these canisters had to be replaced uh, uh, once a day, sometimes twice a day, depending on the activity of the crew. And uh, replacing these canisters uh, was a bit of a of a, of, of, of a job. Uh, you had to pretty much stop just about everything. You had to, uh, you know, uh, unpack these canisters. These canisters, uh, you know, the lithium hydroxide is a powdery substance which uh, sometimes would fly, up, uh, fly off as soon as you unpack it. And uh, it would get into your eyes and your nose and, you know, it would start sneezing and, you know, this sort of contamination issues are very serious. Even things that would not be serious on Earth uh, end up being very serious things uh, in space. Uh, so we have to be very careful about the unpacking and the stowing uh, of these uh, lithium hydroxide uh, canisters. Uh, we got good at it, and I think by now crew members uh, are able to do these procedures quick, quickly. But in those days, we were just, we were just beginning to do this, learning to do this. Uh, you know, meal preparation. You would you wouldn't think that it is such a big deal to prepare a meal, uh, but it is. I mean, in a way, you have to uh, make sure that. Uh, all the, uh, you know, the food uh, preparation is all done correctly, that the food that's dehydrated has to be properly hydrated, has to be uh, reconditioned properly. And um, important is the, um, you know, when, you, when you're going to eat something in space, you got to eat all of it. You know, if, you, if you're going to open a container um, and leave, uh, you know, half of it uh, uneaten, well, that is going to get uh, really bad very and start smelling really bad pretty soon. So, you know, you have to really be considerate of that. So the uh, space um, dining uh, etiquette is essentially, you know, if you open the container, you are eating it, uh, eating all of it. <laughs> No uh, leftovers allowed. 
And um, so, because you have to minimize trash, minimize waste, um, it was very important to, to make sure that everybody understood how to do this and how to you know, keep, keep it all under control. So, uh, and then meal, meal, uh, meal time, you know, uh, we're always so busy. Everybody's so busy and sometimes it's, you know, a tendency is to just go and grab a meal on the, on the run and just sort of eat in the corner wherever you happen to be working. And that is a, a bad thing for long duration flights. Uh, you really want that psychology of the gathering of people around the meal and the, the, the sort of the, the communion part of, uh, of, uh, of meal time is a very important thing, even though perhaps it's not so important on earth because we have so many other distractions and so many other things that uh, compensate for that. But in space, um, it's very easy to see a crew member uh, maybe getting a little depressed, a little lonely, a little, uh, you know, sad. And, and, and crew members have to really be tuned into that to be able to help each other throughout the whole mission. So mealtime is an important time. Uh, um, well, you know, we do spend a lot of time, uh, you know, managing procedures, reading things. And, and even though we have trained ourselves to execute these procedures, with a great deal of precision, um, it is still very important to, uh, you know, to follow the procedures to the letter. And sometimes the procedures are modified in real time by mission control. And so we have to keep track of a lot of paper. You know, there's a lot of paperwork that you do um, uh, in in space. Um, in the old days. Um, we had to manage paperwork. I mean, really, uh, we, we had a, a teleprinter that would be such a bother every morning. He would start uh, uh, typing away papers and, uh, you know, long meters and meters and meters of, uh, of, of paper with information, procedures, news, everything. And everybody would wake up with that noise. And it's, it was really a really a bother, you know. Today, of course, uh, we don't have that. Um, today, people have the electronic cockpit and uh, you know email, and everything is paperless. Uh, so this was has been a big uh, step forward. Uh, hopefully, it's not such that it uh, isolates the crew, um, but uh, you know the. The, the, the managing of the of the information is is a big task also for um, for the crew members. Um, and then uh, there is all the activities that uh, one would have to do outside of the ship. You know, EVAs or uh, uh, spacewalks. Uh, it's a whole nother ball game altogether. And we train uh, extensively for those kinds of activities. We used to train uh, for the tasks that we were going to execute, but now EVAs are more trained um, for the skill of things that you would have to do. Some of those procedures uh, have never been developed uh, because uh, never, uh, you know, the, the situation has not been encountered just yet. And so uh, crew members in long duration flights and all the way to Mars will have to improvise, will have to be able to execute uh, tasks for which they were not trained, but that hopefully they have the skill to be able to be able to accomplish these tasks. On um, STS-111, um, uh, this is the two of us, is, uh, I'm the one with the uh, with the red stripes and, and Pepe, uh, Philip, uh, Philip Ron, uh, our, um, uh, our, he was my buddy from uh, France. Um, the two of us uh, executed three uh, spacewalks on SDS-111. And one of those uh, spacewalks, uh, we had to go and do some ma major surgery onto the um, uh, Canadian uh, robotic arm. In, in essence, we had to remove the wrist 
from the arm and replace uh, one of the big motors uh, that uh, moves those, those, that uh, wrist. And uh, I used to do a lot of auto mechanics and it kind of reminds me of changing a whole transmission in a car um, in, in zero gravity. Of course, it's easier in some ways and, and more difficult in some other ways. But again, it's a, it's a procedure that has to be executed with a great deal of uh, precision, exacting, and uh, coordination uh, between the two, uh, the two crew members. It took us about eight hours to do this. So you go out in the morning, you just get a little bit of breakfast, and uh, you spend eight hours working outside. The only thing you have is just a little bag of water. Uh, hopefully, uh, the, the water will keep you hydrated, but sometimes the water uh, spills and uh, you end up having to drink it all in one single uh, gulp. <laughs> and eventually <laughs> you start uh, getting completely over bloated with uh, water and then you have to pee it all. And, and then you, you become dehydrated for the rest of the, uh, of, of the, of the activity. So, you know, these are little details of, of living and working in space that sometimes don't, don't get it into the, um, you know, into the reports. Um, and uh, the ro robotics uh, are huge, huge aids um, to the to the human uh, crew. crew. Um, you know, it's really it cannot be overstated the importance of uh, of, of robotics, the capability to to support humans <laughs> in their task. Uh, the the Canadian um, robotic complex. Uh, on the space station has been tremendous. In this particular case, uh, we brought uh, with the uh, robotic arm, we, we moved a very large uh, a payload, uh, a piece of the station, it turns out in those days, we we're just still building the station. And this was part of the, um, uh, the mobile transporter, little cart that would move up and down the truss of the space station. And we had to install it and get it all checked out. Uh, the arm was also, it is also used to move a, a person and, and in this particular case, uh, I am getting translated uh, from one end of the station to another. This saves a huge amount of time. Uh, it's one heck of a ride to, you know, to, to ride on the top of that arm and, you know, be way out, uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, um, but it is uh, something that saves a great deal of effort uh, in translating hand-for-hand uh, hand all the length of the uh, space station trust to a, a, a long distance. You got to look out, um, and the Earth is, is beautiful. I mean, it is, it is something that you, you really have to take time to, 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 you know, to watch the spectacle of what you're you know, some, some astronauts have gone up uh, into space, particularly the really busy uh, missions of, of the early sp uh, space labs. And, and some have never, looked, never taken the time to look out the window. They've been so busy. Uh, it's a remarkable thing, but uh, it ha has happened. Um, it is so important to be able to take the time to look and, and, and just witness uh, the spectacle. This particular uh, image of the aurora, I got to see this uh, when I was outside of the, uh, of the spacecraft. That's even more impressive is just to fly through it. Uh, you can see that the edge of the atmosphere, uh, you know, the aurora projects itself above the uh, edge of the atmosphere or the visible edge of the atmosphere anyway. So it's a, it's a beautiful sight. Um, a lot of training is done uh, underwater, and the underwater training is really useful, even though it is not exactly the same as being in zero gravity. But, you know, the, 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 the space station is such a large piece of hardware, so complicated and so um, uh, disorienting. So sometimes, you don't really know which way is up. I mean, actually, there isn't a, a way, there, there isn't an up or down. So it's really important to understand 
how to get from one point to another and understand, be familiar with, it, with, the, with the spacecraft that you're flying. Um, because you can be uh, uh, quite uh, disoriented when you are out, uh, out there, especially if the spacecraft is a very large spacecraft. Um, a lot of um, the training uh, is now done um, in the virtual world. This was just starting about the time when I was uh, out there uh, getting trained. Um, this is in the early 2000s. Um, we were just uh, getting deep into um, a virtual reality, and today is even better. But I tell you, it's one of the most uh, useful pieces of, of, of uh, you know, um, techniques and, and, and ways of learning quickly. Um, and a lot of that is even done uh, in, in flight. So you can actually train for a procedure or a technique or something uh, when you're still in flight. Or you can e even use it to uh, fine tune your your approach and also to, uh, to ref as, a, as a way of refreshing yourself with things that uh, are outside and that uh, when you go outside then you you're familiar with them so virtual virtual reality is very important so uh just switching gears a little bit uh this image i wanted to show you this one um and i think mark carter may be uh, talking to you tomorrow about this uh, song but uh, this is the situation about uh, going to mars you know, the, the, the prominent uh, yellow arrow uh, is really the level of radiation that, um, that you get uh, uh, the longer the flight. So, so what you're plotting, what we're plotting here is the uh, flight time, the round trip, uh, out and back, you know, the, the, the time that, that you're spending in flight um, to Mars as a function of the power this is a, for a nuclear electric uh, um, a propulsion system. You get this family of curves uh, that are all um, have the parameter of alpha. Alpha is um, a, a in the sort of in the parlance of electric propulsion is the number of kilograms per kilowatt, so kilograms per kilowatt of the power and propulsion system of your ship so you know 10 kilograms per kilowatt for example uh, shows you that there is a minimum point um, in this uh, nuclear electric configuration here that has a minimum at about uh, maybe 275 days round trip if you operate at uh, about 10 uh, 10 megawatts uh, of, of, uh, of power of electric power if the uh, technology could be uh, improved uh, to say maybe uh, six kilograms per kilowatt, then you could uh, make the trip faster, maybe uh, 230 or so days round trip, and you would be able to in increase the power to maybe 15 uh, megawatts. And again, if you go to um, you know to an alpha of four, you can now start looking at uh, round trip times of uh, less than 200 days and, and power levels of the order of 20 megawatts and so on and so on and so on. I mean, the, 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 the lower the alpha, the higher the power and also the shorter the trip times. This is the, uh, you know, the holy grail, the, the thing that we're looking for is to try to go to really low values of alpha to be able to keep the radiation under control. You can see the radiation um, is a really big factor that we have to worry about. Um, for me, one of the, the most important things that have to happen or has to happen is the transition from chemical to nuclear. Uh, pretty much the same paradigm that occurred in the 50s when um, submarines transitioned from diesel to nuclear power. This is the Nautilus, and I call it the Nautilus paradigm. The same thing that has to happen in space when a submarine um, such as Nautilus was able to uh, dive in the North Pacific and re resurface in the North Atlantic, having um, uh, you know gone underwater through and crossed under the uh, the North Pole, uh, 
um, a feat that could not be done by any other ship in, in, in its day. Uh, so it completely changed the paradigm of, um, of, of sub submarine uh, uh, operations. Something like that has to happen in space. So these are sort of um, uh, sort of imaginary views of what we would envision a, a ship, uh, nuclear, electric, uh, plasma-driven ship, um, send humans to Mars and, and, and beyond. And, and this, this one is uh, a big ship. You can see compared here to the, to the uh, International Space Station, this ship is only over 600 metric tons. It's got four nuclear reactors. Uh, maybe uh, uh, um, you have some sort of redundancy. Um, the uh, ship uh, would be uh, driven by uh, hydrogen as the, uh, the, the plasma that comes out of the engines would be a hydrogen plasma. And we would, we would um, basically, uh, the, the ship is dominated by the size of the radiators. Uh, the radiators, radiator surface is very large uh, compared to the size of the reactor. But uh, this ship um, would be protecting the crew um, from the radiation by means of hydrogen uh, shielding. And we are also uh, looking at uh, some ideas of uh, wrapping uh, superconducting magnets around uh, the core of the ship so that the crew would be in the center uh, of this uh, architectural assembly here. And um, these uh, superconducting magnets would be high temperature superconductors uh, operating maybe at around 50 Kelvin or so well within the capabilities of uh, liquid hydrogen to support that kind of uh, that temperature. So you would get the, um, both the shielding uh, capability from uh, hydrogen uh, pellant and also from the magnetic field. Uh, both of them would, would help you on the uh, on shielding. So these are just uh, uh, ideas. Uh, we uh, dream on, of course, to you know ships that uh, would be very robust, very powerful, and um, uh, they will all be nuclear powered. Uh, in this particular case, uh, nuclear electric. Uh, uh, you know, multi-megawatt ships that now uh, would go even beyond Mars. So we would be able to go to the Jupiter system and explore the, the moons of, of Jupiter. So this is all kind of the way our imagination uh, moves us. So I wanted to just end here uh, with this uh, last uh, image, uh, which is one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, slides uh, is the sunset. Uh, on Mars, um, uh, a picture that uh, no human has taken yet. Maybe uh, in a, a couple of decades, uh, some astronaut that's probably already alive um, will take that picture, maybe a selfie, maybe um, put, it, put it on Facebook or something and send it to his friends. And it would be nice to see that. And, uh, I wish uh, uh, this future explorers uh, uh, Godspeed and uh, much success in their mission. So, and that—that uh, that is uh, all I have for you to, uh, today or tonight. Uh, so, thank you very much.